You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the Unsolved Colonial Parkway Murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. That makes me Bill Thomas. There's no doubt about this. I'm glad we sorted this out. It helps because not only do we know who we are and what we're about, we actually know who's going to say what and in what order. We're very professional. We work this stuff out way ahead of time. (laughs) Total professionals. That's us. So we are back this week with part three of our interview with writer-producer David Rambo from my favorite series, in case that wasn't clear to anybody, CSI. Oh, and by the way, it's probably worth mentioning that Marg Helgenberger commented on Twitter about how much she was enjoying our conversation with David Rambo. And this caused Kristen Dilley to go into a great explosion of fangirl enthusiasm. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I totally did. <laughs> Ran around the house a couple of times. Marg, if you're listening, <laughs> thanks for listening. Big fan. I would say more if I possibly could, but I can't. (laughs) Okay, calming down a bit. We've added a new feature here at Mind Over Murder, and that allows you the opportunity to support the good work we hope we're doing here. If you go to our Anchor page, which is our sort of homepage where all of the episodes of the podcast reside, we've added a new feature. There's a support button. And if you click on that support button, you can... Make a small contribution to show your support for Mind Over Murder. So for as little as 99 cents a month, and I realize I'm starting to sound like a used car salesman, (laughs) you can support the good work that we're doing here at Mind Over Murder, which helps pay for this fancy equipment. And then someday when we travel again, we were just discussing whether or not we're ever going to get on an airplane, it would support work like that. We very much appreciate your support, your kind words, the great reviews that we're seeing on the various podcast platforms. We did just cross over 75,000 downloads this week, which is terrific. And thanks to everyone for your support. Uh, Listener support would go toward, for example, CrimeCon. And we are very much looking forward to CrimeCon, whether that's in October or next year in Austin. But we are definitely looking forward to it. Some of you have already commented that you're looking forward to seeing us there. And we are looking forward to seeing you, too. I'm looking forward to just getting out of the house, frankly. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And it would be really fun to see people that uh, we know, many of them electronically. Uh, Even if it does mean wearing a mask, which we know that it will, uh, we're very much looking forward to hanging out with people, meeting people, chatting, and getting out of the house. Sure. And we'll just do it from a distance of six feet apart while wearing masks. No handshakes. No handshakes. And apparently, and I'm sure Cheryl McCollum's going to have a real hard time with this, apparently no hugs either. <laughs> yeah. She's a, big yeah. Hu- she's a big hugger. And she's wonderful. So she is well worth a, a big cuddly hug. So we also wanted to mention that upcoming on Thursday, June 18th at 5.30 in the afternoon, Eastern Daylight Time, you can check out a friend of the podcast, retired supervisory special agent, James R. Fitzgerald, aka Fitz. He has a lecture on YouTube on Thursday, the 18th of June. And if you are so inclined, go ahead and hop over to any of his social pages where he has posted all of this information. Set a reminder on your phone. And then tune in to hear Fitz talk about his career. We do have a couple of upcoming episodes with Fitz where he talks about the Unabom case. So we are very much looking forward to hearing from him again. But if you cannot wait until our episodes with Fitz, go ahead and tune in on June 18th and listen to an excellent lecture from the man, the myth, the legend, James R. Fitzgerald. We'll include some links to where you can find Fitz's upcoming lecture in the show notes for this episode, because we're nothing if not helpful. Speaking of other upcoming episodes, 
The Virginian pilot reported that Dennis Lee Bowman has now pled guilty to the murder of Kathleen O'Brien Doyle. You may recall we've been following this case for several months and we'll be covering this case in upcoming episodes of Mind Over Murder. Bowman is the former Navy reservist. He's now 71 years old. He has been charged in the 1980 murder of Navy wife Kathleen O'Brien Doyle. We will be covering that case as well as an additional case where Dennis Lee Bowman has been charged in the murder of his 14-year-old adopted daughter. Her birth name was Alexis Badger. Her adopted name was Andrea Bowman. And as part of this investigation into the 1980 murder of Kathleen O'Brien Doyle, apparently he confessed, I guess is probably the right word, to the murder of his 14-year-old adopted daughter. Her mother, Kathy Turkanian, her birth mother, has been seeking justice in her daughter's disappearance for many, many years. And we have a terrific interview coming up with Kathy Turkanian. And we'll be exploring that case in more depth. And another case that we have been following, as we know a number of you all are, is the case of Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow, children who have been missing and whose parents, Lori Vallow and her second husband, Chad Daybell, fled to Hawaii several months ago and refused to answer questions as to where the children were. We did find out, sadly, that their remains have been recovered on the property of Chad Daybell in Idaho. This is just a terrible case, and we were just talking about this offline. The more we learn about these two, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, it appears that they are involved in some sort of death cult that springs from a series of books, works of fiction, that Chad Daybell has written and published. Lori Vallow believes that she is somehow supposed to be directly responsible for the second coming of Jesus Christ scheduled for, when is it, July? July, scheduled for July as in next month, so you can cross off another one on Apocalypse Bingo, I suppose. The two of them could not be more reprehensible. In addition to the apparent murder of her two children, law enforcement is now looking into the possibility that they murdered his previous wife, two weeks prior to their very sudden wedding, as as well as her former husband and another family member who killed her former husband. Several of these people supposedly died of natural causes, and I'm having a real hard time believing that. Watch this space. This case just goes on and on and on and gets more and more bizarre. Both Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell are are now under arrest in Idaho, at least at this point, for the disappearance and now apparent murder of her two children. And this is certainly something that we are going to keep a close eye on and may consider covering in future episodes. So uh, we will continue to post information on our Mind Over Murder Facebook page as it becomes available. On a more optimistic note, we we just wanted to uh, remind you to enjoy our final part of our interview with David Rambo, just to help you pick this up. It's very helpful if you listen to episode one and episode two of our terrific conversation with David. As you start episode three, we're at a transition point where William Peterson, the former star of CSI has just left the show and David Rambo is one of the writer producers is telling us about how the show came to bring on noted actor Lawrence Fishburne to join the cast. So William Peterson leaving and Lawrence Fishburne arriving. We hope you enjoy the conversation. And when Billy left and the calls started going out, Lawrence Fishburne's name came up and we just thought, yeah, we've got to get Fishburne. Yeah, absolutely. And also then that clearly showed that we went with a, an African-American guy and a completely mm-hmm. different style in terms of his approach. And so it did kind of provide a clear line of demarcation from one character to the next. Yeah. And it acquired the show had a different tone almost with Lawrence. And I loved writing for Lawrence. We had 
sort of met through mutual friends uh, before this, and I'd always, I'd long, really wanted to work with him. But the character that we wrote initially turned out to change, to evolve a lot, not quite be the character that he ended up playing. And I think after two and a half seasons, he was ready to move on as well. And the show changed as well, too. The showrunners changed. You know, these things happen. And you, you go down the new path. It's still CSI. You're still going to hear the who singing, who are you? Right. And your blood's going to race a little and you're going to have a great story. Yeah. But it, it did change. And it probably needed to. And mm -hmm. y you can't stay mired in one thing. And obviously, when an actor makes a decision, particularly a key player like the folks we're talking about, it does present an opportunity and a challenge, I would imagine, for the writer producers. It does. You want to serve the show, but you also really want to use the best gifts that your actor is bringing, whether it's, you know, a man or a woman, whoever. You really want to draw the best out of them. I'm sad that I didn't get to work with Ted Danson. I got to meet him at the 300th episode party. I was invited to that, even though I wasn't on the show anymore. And I spent practically the whole party sitting, talking with Ted Danson. I really wish I could have written for him. He was delightful. He Game really was. Anything. I mean, he's a very he's a very different actor than Billy mm -hmm. or or Lawrence Fishburne is. But the tone of the show was really different, but it worked really yeah. really well. I also think the country had changed in those yeah. you know fifteen years. I think one of the reasons CSI was a hit was that it debuted right around the time of nine eleven, and <laughs> as a country, we were very hungry for answers to the unimaginable and to bad guys getting caught in a kind of a new way. We all felt that the game had changed. And I think the audiences were ready as a culture. We were ready for a new form of good guy, bad guy storytelling. I think that had a lot to do with the success of the show. But by the time Billy left and then Fishburne, the country was different. And Ted Danson was kind of the perfect guy to lead the crime lab in the, the mood of the country at that time. It's called popular entertainment popular culture. It, you have to respond to what's going on in the world. Even though you didn't have the ripped from the headlines claim that other long running series like Law and Order had, you were drawing a lot from uh, real life stories and things that were happening both scientifically and in terms of what was happening with crime, not necessarily high profile mm -hmm. cases, but things that were going on in the real life version of CSI. Exactly. And that was fun. You know, we had <laughs> we had kind of a story watch. If you saw a good real life story in the news, we would quickly send like a link to the story over to our executive at Bruckheimer Television to say, we want to reserve this story. Don't let Miami or New York do it. Mm hmm. Oh, well, yeah, that's right. Little sharp elbows now. <laughs> <exactly>. <laughs> well, we think the other shows had people up through the night looking at stories because I cannot tell you how many times we heard, <laughs> oh, Miami already got They got that. Story. New York's reserved this. And we were, you know, damn, because we tried to rip from the headlines, but the headlines are being ripped away from us. <laughs> Taking advantage of the time difference and then they get there just before you guys. I don't know how they did it. But I like that you guys did have some very topical episodes. The one I was watching last night, Coup de Gras, you oh. know, about racial profile was was a shooting racially motivated was it not I, like I, I thought that was very topical because that has always been sort of a hot button issue here it was interesting to see a very different take on that concept i really enjoyed that episode oh i'm so glad you know that was a, a bit of a tough sell because it's the first time i think that the show touched on the wire of race mm -hmm. and lawrence uh, I told Lawrence we were going to do the story. That was ripped from the headlines. That was uh, drawn from a real-life case in New York. An off-duty African-American cop in plain clothes, he's off-duty, was shot by a uniformed cop who uh, was white. Just thinking, well, one presumes the white cop thought, black guy in this neighborhood this hour, not good, told him to freeze. And dry. and the, the guy was saying, whoa, 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 I'm a cop, I'm a cop. He wasn't, com he wasn't complying with the command. And he was shot. So I took, I told Lawrence we were going to do the story. And Lawrence said, uh-huh, I'll reserve any thoughts I have until I see the script. And I thought, okay, <laughs> the bar is very high. <laughs> One of our real-life CSIs turned writer producers is Richard Catalani. And he's a ballistic expert by mm -hmm. training. A serologist who became a ballistics expert. He helped me with the story. 
I'm very proud of the episode. It's the only thing I've ever written for television that's been awarded for the writing. It got a from the Television Academy. It got something called a Program of Distinction. Award. Very impressive. <laughs> oh, I'm very proud of it. We found a study that from Michigan where they ran cops of all races through simulated situations. Right. That are, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in one of those, but they're terrifying. It's the real thing. You think you're being shot. Right. The way they, they stage them. And the study proved that race was a factor only in like 2%. And I don't want to give the wrong number. I'm giving this as an example. But in <laughs> some very low percentage of the cases, it was more situ- about the situation. And, and, and the fear and the yeah. adrenaline and the surprise. Exactly. And then a lot of these situations are happening in the dark. Things mm-hmm. happen, And things happen fast. And people make judgments thinking their lives are on the line. Whether it turns out they, they are or they are not at that moment, they think they're under attack or whatever. You know, that we, we have a scene in the layout, not the layout room, in the break room where um, it's, one, it's the only time in, all, in any of my scripts where Marg Helgenberger asked if her character could not say something that was that had was kind of profound. I had C- Catherine say, listen, we all do things that reveal ourselves in moments of str- I mean, in traffic, you say things, you see somebody, you say mm-hmm. things you'd never say in other, you know, other situations, something like that. And she said, I just I just don't want Catherine to be thought of that way. I don't. And that was fine. I changed the line. But it was really interesting how touching on race revealed so much. Uh, and now that we had an African-American leading man on the show, number one on the call yeah, sheet. Yeah, yeah, uh, it was The unspoken became spoken. And it was a pretty profound experience for the whole cast, the whole crew. What did Lawrence Fishburne say to you then when he saw the script? Did he feel like the tone was right? Lawrence said nothing. He just did it. The only thing he's, and which I took as a high compliment. He looked at me at one point. It was some one speech he had to give where he quoted that study. Mm-hmm. And he looked at me and raised an eyebrow. I said, this is real, right? And I said, this is real. I can show you the article. He said, I don't need to see the article. If you say it's real, it's real. Yeah, so and there was a it. trust there in terms of oh, yeah. your in- integrity. And he, he was willing to take you at your word. He's a big motorcycle rider. And... um he liked me because I wrote a, an episode that put him on motorcycles for most of it. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, wow, this is cool. This is almost like not working. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Hog heaven. I thought you were going to say it's because you were a fellow motorcycle enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hardly. <laughs> hardly. <laughs> oh, we described you at the top. My brother is. <laughs> yeah, my brother repairs and and deals in motorcycles in North Carolina. He's a real biker. Uh-huh. Yeah, but that was me. not an interest you shared with Mr. No, Fishburne. No, 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 no. So what's next for you now? This, you know, I know we've done this really fun deep dive on CSI and, and Kristen could definitely keep going. But we, yeah. <laughs> let's talk about, about what are you working on now besides relaxing and staying safe at home? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm very fortunate. I spent most of last year working on a a show that will debut on Netflix, I think, in September. It's called Tiny Pretty Things. It's about as I'd say it's about as far from the crime lab as you can get. But there actually is a crime at the heart of it. It's set in an elite ballet academy. And it's a gorgeous show based on a novel by the same title. This is created by Michael McLennan. And it's set in an elite ballet academy in Chicago. We have an incredibly talented young cast who are fantastic dancers, wonderful actors. We did 10 episodes. It was a huge, huge production, and it's just gorgeous, and I'm really proud of it. That'll premiere, I think, in September. And while we're waiting for that to premiere, I've joined the last season of a TNT show called Claws, which has crime in every episode. That is such fun. In fact, we were shooting that in New Orleans until, um, you know, we were shut down from the pandemic. So you'll so, you'll be heading back once things get better? Yeah, we're actually still working on the writing. The writers are meeting virtually every mm-hmm, day mm-hmm. and still writing the last couple of scripts. So I'm one of the lucky writers that still has his job right. at least for, you know, a few more weeks. Yeah, the, the physical production takes place in, in New Orleans. Yeah, doubling for Florida. 
Interesting. I it's was, a fun series. It, the old episodes are on uh, Hulu, and then the new ones are on TNT. TNT Claws. We'll check, yeah. We'll check that out. Claws like cat claws or? Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, don't, don't put your... One of the most frequent questions we're asked here at Mind Over Murder is, how can I help? Thanks to Othram, a leading forensic DNA testing lab for law enforcement, you can get involved and help solve real cases. If you have tested at a consumer genetics company, you can contribute your data to dnasolves.com. The process is easy and confidential. Just two simple steps. Your DNA might be the missing piece that helps solve the identity of an unknown person. Then Mind Over Murder will highlight cases Othram is working on to seek your crowdfunding support for DNA testing to help solve these cold cases. Upload your DNA profile to dnasolves.com. It's easy, free, and confidential. Then join Mind Over Murder as we help families find answers with Othram and dnasolves.com. Do you like our show, Mind Over Murder, and want to create your own podcast? Well then, let us tell you about Anchor. First of all, it's free. And who doesn't love free, right? I like free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. You can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create, whether it's music analysis, your own radio show, or something the world's never heard before. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many more platforms. And you can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I like the sound of that. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Right here, Anchor. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started on your own podcast. You can tell them Kristen and Bill from Mind Over Murder sent you. legal hat on put your your uh, your animal claws hat on. <laughs> it's about a bunch of manicurists that are washing money and running drugs for the Dixie mafia <laughs> well hey fantastic. Wow. it sounds great <laughs> oh, it, just just watch the pilot you'll be hooked it's just great absolutely yeah Money laundering's done very well <laughs> in, <laughs> in the last couple of years on Netflix. Oh, yeah. Wow. And I'm still writing plays and still working in the theater, which is my great love. And, um, you know, anxious to see what's next. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, at the risk of introducing a sensitive subject, I had read a couple of years ago about this series on Ronald Reagan that you were working on. Did, oh, yeah. Did that ever happen? Because I don't remember it. No, it hasn't happened. It was developed with USA Network. Reagan's daughter, Patty, is a close friend. Uh, right, Wonderful right. writer. I never wanted to write about Ronald Reagan. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I love politics. I just, I remembered Reagan as the president who drove my father into bankruptcy in five foreclosures and let all my friends die of AIDS. Right. I just did not he, get the guy. He, he was not at the top of your list of favorite presidents. No, no. But he was some somebody's father. In fact, he was father to four. He, really five. He, had, he and Jane Wyman had a daughter who died uh, only a few hours after she was born. But mm. he, regardless of what you think of him and his politics and his ascent, there was a man there. There was a father and a husband. And Patty who had her own problems with him politically and yes, otherwise yeah, right. uh, helped me see the part of her father that she loved. Patty was asked to do a mini series, pre- executive produce a mini series about her father's life, his early life before right. the white house. Right. And she, she said, no, she didn't want to. And she, you know, if she's going to write anything about her family. It wouldn't be a television series. And then they say, well, what if David Rambo wrote it? And given that we were friends from an earlier project, she said, well, that would be different. Yeah. So we took it to USA. They were they wanted to do a, a biography. See, I don't want to spend too much time on this. It's a project that never got off the ground. But they wanted to do a biographical miniseries. And they ended up doing Evil Knievel, which I think will air in the fall. I'm not sure. But I turned in great material. 
We'll see if it ever. Oh, so at this. The light this, of the screen. Well, I, I was talking to Kristen about this. It sounded so interesting, but I said, boy, even for television, this is taking a really long time. I said, I'm not sure if this <laughs> program is still in development or not, but it was a cool idea because of the combination of Patty Reagan and, and yourself. I thought this could be really, really interesting. So it's sadly unlikely to ever see the light of day. I don't know. You know, it's 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 not in my hands at this point. It's in the hands of other producers who are very committed to getting it on the air. I mm-hmm. think it would be interesting, controversial, because you can't bring up a politician today in this sure. polarized climate without it being <laughs> controversial. But I also think it was revelatory, you know, because of Patty's involvement. We were able to drama and to, frankly, because Nancy Reagan was no longer living, we were able to. That's right. Talk about things she never, you know, Nancy never let anybody talk about his first wife. If you no. want to be Nancy's friend, you never said the words Jane Wyman in her presence. Right. And she was so protective of his legacy. Obviously, yeah. that dynamic would change with Mrs. Reagan's passing. And of course, they're both gone. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you probably could have the opportunity to do some really interesting exploration, particularly where. You know, I was reading that this is the only project of this type that had a Reagan family member, a, a member of that yeah. very closed circle of family members yeah. participating. And, and as you were saying, you wanted to get some insight into the man. We all know about his presidency, whether we were supporters or, you know, not yeah. of, of Reagan. He's, you know, certainly not one of my favorites. And you're right. Everything now, if you were to run this show next fall. Gee, interesting timing. You know, (laughs) as you said, our our times are even more politically polarized than they've ever been before. Yeah. Or it sure seems that way. Yeah. I called it when we were taking it out to talk to different networks about it. They would say, why, why this show? Why now? I said, it's America porn. He had a life (laughs) that would only have happened in America in the 20th century. Yeah. And, you know, whether you loved him or hated him, even his, the, the Clintons, everybody always said the same thing. You, he was impossible not to like him when you were in his presence. Yeah. And he loved the United States of America fiercely. It defined him as much as his faith did. And those two things together made him who he was right up to the end of his life. Mm, that's true. So that may happen someday. But in the meantime, then, Tiny Pretty Things is heading to Netflix. Yeah, look for that. It'll be fun. And then you're working on this TNT series, Claws. Claws in its final season. I just, I'm sorry, it's its final season. It's my first one on board. And it's re- it's outrageous fun. I, you know, I, The writer's room actually is the closest thing to the CSI room I've had since CSI. Oh, wow. Because, I mean, anything goes. We can talk. It's, you'll see when you see the show. It's so extreme. It, it's just, it isn't afraid to go anywhere. And we, we saw the CSI room was. Yeah. We were never afraid to go anywhere. We got <laughs> pulled back sometimes. <laughs> and by the way, influences on the writers of CSI. We were, you asked about Rip from the headlines. We were far more influenced as writers by, the, by some of the one-hour drama that was on television at the time that really wasn't crime shows. It was uh, Six Feet Under and Mad Men and Queer as Folk. We were more influenced by them than any of the crime shows. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's what we talked about. Yeah. Monday morning. Did you see over the weekend? Well, and some of those shows were very much at their peak in terms of, and I'm talking about creativity here too, just, you know, fantastic stories and really interesting things going on. And you're right. You wouldn't necessarily be looking at other crime shows or other procedurals for your inspiration. I mean, you know, they're the competition on some level. Yeah. I mean, we're all fans of, of them. Believe me, we watched, uh, it was fun, but we always felt that we, our show was better <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> every single episode. But, you know, on the whole, we always, we had, we were very proud of how diligent we were about the science and about, I mean, when we, uh, if, if I would watch an episode of a crime show with my colleagues, where someone came on the scene, saw a piece of evidence, and picked it up, 
without documenting it first or wearing gloves, we'd go berserk. <laughs> <laughs> like I that, still do. That, that's not how it's done. Exactly. Document it in place first. First rule. <laughs> <laughs> I love well, it. And, you know, when we were talking earlier about that, you know, that real life situation, which admittedly was terrifying. When the crazy guy showed up at your house and yeah. was trying to break in. <laughs> exactly. And then, you know, after the police have made the arrest and you're thinking, well, we need to process this crime scene. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I, I didn't have evidence bags. But, you know, I, I met through the show, I met a wonderful woman named Astrid Heppenstahl Hager, a physician who runs, she created she runs a lot of things in uh, public health in Los Angeles, but she created a forensic emergency room down at County USC Hospital where she was seeing victims, particularly of domestic violence, uh, mm -hmm. children and adults coming in and arrests never being made because a victim of a crime like that, whether it's a rape or a beating, their body is the crime scene. Yes. And you want to treat you want to treat the body. You want to treat the injuries. But as soon as you do that, you're corrupting the crime you're scene. Totally compromising. Yeah. Yes. And she worked with the district attorney's office and the crime lab to come up with a way where she actually has everybody there is now trained in evidence collection. Mm -hmm. They have official evidence bags and a and an evidence locker where everything is documented. So the chain of custody is never can never be questioned at trial. Right. And it's led to so many convictions that never would have happened otherwise. I mean, Fantastic. encountering, yeah, encountering people like that are, that's, she'd be a great guest for your show, by the way. She really speaks beautifully about her work. But those, those kinds of experiences and meeting people like that, that's the gift of being able to work on a show like CSI. Right, right. How cool. Actually, she sounds yeah. great. We'll get her info. We'd love to have her on the show. Yeah, oh, that sure, sounds tremendous. Yeah. It's funny. We've we've done a, a little bit of work with uh, End the Backlog and their effort to work on getting rape kits tested yeah. and entered into the CODIS database and so on. And we're going to be talking about a case in, in the coming months where a rape kit which sat untested on law enforcement shelves for almost 20 years resulted in a, in a significant arrest and the guy's being brought to trial currently in a case that we're following very closely in Virginia. These kind of situations where it's so important that the victim of sexual assault be handled in, in a way that allows them to begin their recovery. But at the same time, there's a crime that hopefully can be mm -hmm. prosecuted. And it's so important that steps like this are taken. This is an absolutely brilliant initiative. I think that's amazing stuff. Yeah, it's an amazing program. It should be nationwide. I think, I mean, other hospitals and emergency rooms have picked this up now, but it's uh, it's still not as widespread as it should be. And it's just, it changes lives. No, absolutely. It helps heal. Yeah. It's funny, you know, when I was making notes a second ago about your, your show, uh, Claws, on TNT, huh? and uh, my notes say, uh, I wrote down TNT, Claws, New Orleans. And then I thought, that sounds like a great <laughs> name for a show. <laughs> Claws, New Orleans. That's the spinoff. <laughs> so did you ever get to uh, throw down the, when you know you're talking to the Bruckheimer people, do you get to throw down the, wait a minute, we were there first. Those other guys, they don't matter quite as much as we do. Because come on, who put you there? <laughs> No, really? No, those guys are our friends. All um, right. I've worked for several <laughs> producers over the years since my TV career started on CSI. Yeah. And uh, I don't know when I've had better partners in Bruckheimer Television. They're they're fantastic. And when they called me to come back to help Anthony break the story for the series finale, the two part yeah. movie, I. I was so thrilled. No, and, and that's so incredibly yeah. flattering, David, for yeah. them to yeah. for them to bring you back. You know, that talk yeah. about decisions in television are not made for sentimental reasons. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Sentiment is expensive. Television doesn't spend the money. Yeah. It, it you know, they brought you back because they knew you were going to write a fantastic close to that uh, incredible era of television. Yeah, well, Anthony did the writing. Liz and I just helped him break the story and 
talk through some possibilities. You're probably being modest, knowing you. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, it's Anthony's baby, and that meant the world to him. He Listen, what he created changed the culture, changed the way mm -hmm. crime is prosecuted, changed the way crime is committed. I, how many people have that kind of an impact? Now, he had a lot of <laughs> He'd be the first to tell you. But it happened because he was playing poker to make a living while he was in school, uh -huh. grad school with Daniel Holstein, this night night shift Vegas CSI, who also played poker and was a killer poker player. In fact, in an episode that I wrote, I, I needed to do a back room old Vegas poker game. And I thought, Daniel's never been on the show. And I got Daniel to play one of the poker players at the table. And that was kind of fun. Because we also had Robert Guillaume, as a, an old Vegas entertainer. Oh, very and cool. And we had uh, Ralph Waite, Paul Walton, played old sheriff. The old wow, sheriff. talk about some great actors. This is a lot of oh, horsepower. it was an amazing day. And I had George Slaughter at the table. And George, many people know, uh, was a guy who created Laugh-In, a great variety television producer. Mm -hmm. But before that, he, he was an entertainment director in Vegas. He booked Sammy Davis and... Uh, Marlena Dietrich and Pearl Bailey and all these people into the showrooms. He had all wow. these stories. See, I'd want to just, you know, bring George back just so we can go to dinner and hear some cool stories. Oh, he's the best storyteller. The best. You got Tippy Hedren for one episode too. What was she like? That was that same episode. Tippy was great. Tippy was great. And I, I, I had kind of known her through mutual friends and always wanted to find a right, the right part for her. She played the widow of a, casino owner and this is based on a true story i read that there was a casino in vegas that was the first integrated casino in vegas and it opened in 1955 i think in i want to say in october um and it was a big splash all black headliners all black entertainment and because these black entertainers would perform on the strip and then have to go sleep in somebody's house, they couldn't sleep in the in the hotels where yeah. they were performing. Yeah, it was very segregated. Vegas called itself the Mississippi of the West. They were proud of the segregation. Mm -hmm. But I also found out that barely six months after it opened, it shut down like that one night, just shut right down. George Slaughter remembered that they were taking, they were paying people off in nickels and quarters from the slot machines that they'd managed to cart out in sugar sacks before the padlocks went on. And nobody knew who was locking up or why it happened. Well, what really happened was in those six months, the white entertainers on the strip would say at the end of their shows, now, thank you for coming to my show. I'm Frank Sinatra or Marlena Dietrich. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to the best show in town right now over at the Moulin Rouge. And they'd all go over to this club, which was called the Moulin Rouge. And when there are only five hotels on the Strip and all your white customers are going late at night to the uh, integrated casino on the north end of town, the Strip casino owners didn't like that. And I don't have to tell you who they were. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And it got shut down. Now, here's why I wrote the episode. I found out that the showroom sat there locked up for 50 years. Wow. And, nobody, and when they unlocked it and went in, there were still cigarettes in the ashtrays, lipstick trace on martini glasses on the table. It's like somebody just said, everybody out, and it was never touched. And it's like a time capsule. Yeah. Wow. So we created that experience. We turned the old Tower Theater, movie theater in downtown Los Angeles, into the showroom mm -hmm. at, at what we called the Chateau Rouge. Right. And we did a sort of old Vegas present day. Vegas. I made it the Phantom of the Opera. I had an old musician who had played mm -hmm. there who was still living in the premises that right. everybody thought was a ghost. Yeah. It was a fun, great episode. And Tippy played the widow of the guy who built the casino. What fun. And yeah. how cool to put all those elements together into this really cool story. And even, even the name of your fictional casino was a tip of the hat to the Moulin Rouge. Exactly. We called it the Chateau Rouge. And I, the, doing the episode brought me into contact with a woman who had danced the original Moulin Rouge. She was a, I think, 16-year-old girl at the time. Mm -hmm. She sort of was the keeper of the flame of the Moulin Rouge lore. And I went to Vegas and took her to dinner and heard all the stories. And it was just such a great experience. Yeah, I can imagine. That wow. is incredible.
I was excited about the tippy headron thing, and then you start mixing in all the other elements. Uh, this is <laughs> such so cool. What a what it's a an privilege. episode called "Young Man with a Horn," and it was it was our tip of the hat to American Idol, which was enormously popular at the time. Right, right. Well, it's so cool. It's funny for what it's worth. I'll just mention this at the end, David. I'm so thrilled you reached out to me a couple of weeks ago as a friend, just checking in. And said, as a fan of Mind Over Murder. Well, thank you. But we as were a fan. we were so tickled by that. And then, you know, I, I explained to to Kristen who you were. And um and Pamela, my partner, said, Weren't you on the Western Council with David Rambo? Is that the same guy? Because you know, she remembered your name. It's a very sure. distinctive name. And I said, yes, this is the same guy. And she said, well, why did he reach out to you? And I said, well, he was paying a compliment about this yeah. little true crime podcast. I listened to it as Leonard and I take our walks over the hills. Well, oh, that's amazing. Does, does, yeah. does Leonard enjoy it as much as you do? <laughs> <laughs> he knows daddy's happy when he's listening to crime talk. Oh, yeah. well. Well, we're so flattered. It's wonderful to catch up with you a little bit. And Same. we cannot thank you enough. And I see Kristen grinning on my screen here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this has been so wonderful. Pleasure. I'm having the biggest fangirl meltdown right now. You can't even uh. tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to do it again if uh, Mr. Rambo is up for it. Anytime. Anytime. It's so great to talk to you both. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll look forward to having you again on Mind Over Murder. Wonderful. Thank you. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.